Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this is a very fascinating series on how to interpret Scripture. The Bible and Prophecy is the title of this lesson. It's lesson number 11 in that series for June 13 of 2020. And as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Our wonderful Father, we thank you for these records that we have that we can place our trust in. We thank you for all the trouble it has cost down through the generations for you to work with so many people to make these records available to us. Help us now to see uh, exactly how we can learn to understand the prophecies that are given in, in the Bible, especially in the book of Daniel, and what they can mean to us. May this enlighten us and, in, and encourage us as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> in previous lessons, we have repeatedly stated that one of the ways that the true God distinguishes himself from all other so-called gods is a, his ability to predict the future far in advance. And of course, we know there is only one God. The other is his ability to create out of nothing. Thus, Bible prophecy is essential in our identity and mission in support of our belief in the true God. And that's such an important point that if you read the book of Isaiah, chapters 40 to 55, it focuses on those issues. It goes over it and over and over it again. Powerful testimony to the fact that the true God can predict the future far in advance. Not only that, but he can create out of nothing. And those are the two primary things that he really nails down there. It has been estimated that up to 30% of the Bible's contents have some prophetic application. And there's three verses in the Gospel of John that help us to understand the exact role of, of prophecy. Look at John 14, 29. I have told you this now before it all happens so that when it does happen, you will believe. So what's the purpose of prophecy? <clears throat> when it does happen, that we might you believe. will believe. Dropping back a chapter, look at chapter 13, John 13, verse 19. I tell you this now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am who I am. Okay, and then over to John 16, 4, verse 4. But I have told you this, so that when the time comes for them to do these things, you will remember that I told you. So what's the purpose of prophecy? To me, I think that great I am mm -hmm. yeah. is established throughout history. Mm -hmm. I am that I am. Mm -hmm. I am that no one who sent yep. me. You see, so. And prophecy just shows us that God knows. Yes. He knew in advance. Bang, it happens. Oh yeah, there, look at that. God predicted it. Bang, it happened. God predicted it. Bang, it happened. God predicted it. If we had time, we could go on for the whole rest of the day here talking about the prophecies that God predicted and how they were fulfilled. There are can, many in the Bible. Can anyone think about any other faith groups like Christians who do have a, a book that talks about prophecies? No. None. There's no. none. No. And 30% of the scriptures is prophecies. Mm -hmm. Well, we can refer to these prophecies that actually happened. We can recognize them and acknowledge God's power and recognize that he is the, Charles, I am who I am. Can we be sure that we are interpreting prophecy correctly? One of the great questions in dealing with interpretation of prophecy is the question of which method you're going to use. There's a historicist method. That means that things are laid out historically and God predicts in advance. There's a preterist method. We'll talk more about that. And there's a futurist method. There are people who believe that basically all the prophecies of the Bible, especially the long-term ones, are, are, going, are talking about things that are going to happen way down at the end of this world's history. So still future. And of course, that's why it's called the futurist method. Up until the times of the Counter-Reformation, what was the Counter-Reformation? 
Netflix having their bite of the cookie, you might say. Their, their, their response to the Protestant Reformation, wasn't it? That's right. Conducted by the Catholic Church in response to the Protestant Reformation, interpreters of Daniel and Revelation consistently use the historicist method. It's, it's the obvious one. Was the Jesuits, uh, they were commissioned really to destroy, or was it also part of the counter-revolution then? Hmm. So, the historicist method teaches that history is linear. It begins with the conflict in heaven, Revelation 12, 7 through 12. Let's just read those verses quickly. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon who fought back with his angels. But the dragon was defeated and he and his angels were not allowed to stay in heaven any longer. The huge dragon was thrown out, that ancient serpent called the devil. When we mention an ancient serpent, what does it make you think of? Or Satan yes, that deceived Lord. the whole world. There he was in the tree with Eve, wasn't he? He was thrown down to earth and all his angels with him. And they came to this earth in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve believed the snake instead of God and ate the fruit, as presented in Genesis 3. It progressed consistently forward, step by step, until the second coming of Jesus, and then, after a thousand years, the third coming, when God will reestablish his kingdom on this earth. So what are the main reasons why we believe in the historicist method? Jim? We are to see in history the fulfillment of prophecy, to study the workings of providence in the great reformatory movements, and to understand the progress of events in the marshalling of the nations for the final conflict of the great controversy. Testimonies of the Church, Volume 8, 307. The most impressive time prophecies in the Bible are found in Daniel 2, 7, 8, and Revelation 13, which is a sort of repetition. Well, look at Daniel 2, and I'm not going to read all of this, but Daniel is coming, and what's, what's the prophecy of Daniel 2? It's the great image. That great image, and there's a yeah. gold head, and there's silver, and silver there's and bronze, bronze or brass, and there's legs of iron, iron, and there's feet of iron and clay, right? So Daniel replied, Your Majesty, there is no wizard, magician, or fortune teller, or astrologer who can tell you that. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has informed your majesty what will happen in the future. Okay, what happened to the preterist model? Now I will tell you the dream, the vision you had while you were asleep. While your majesty was sleeping, you dreamt about the future, and God, who reveals mysteries, showed you what is going to happen. Now this mystery was revealed to me, not because I am wiser than anyone else, but so that your majesty may learn the meaning of your dream and understand the thoughts that have come to you. And so then he spells out the details. And I mean, imagine, think of, about, you have this incredible dream. You can't remember that the dream was, but you know it's there and you're struggling in your mind. And here comes someone and tells you exactly yeah. what happened in your dream. Well, is, well, that, hum is that humanly possible? <laughs> The Lord had his hand in this. No question yeah. about it. Yeah. Well, Nebuchadnezzar's dream is interpreted by Daniel in, by, in Daniel 2 is well known. Clearly the head of gold, the arms and chest of silver, the belly and thighs of brass, the legs of iron, the feet of iron and clay, and the stone cut out without hands suggest a continuous, uninterrupted progression in world history. There's not a gap between the, the belly and the legs, for example. I mean, it just goes on. In Daniel 7 and Daniel 8, we see a different set of images. There are beasts, each one symbolizing a different empire from the days of Babylon until the second coming of Jesus. From our vantage point, near the end of this world's history, it should be easy for us to recognize the truthfulness of these prophecies. One of the keys necessary for interpreting how these prophecies are laid out and the history of our world is what is known as the year-day principle. Carrie? Yeah. You will suffer the consequences of your sin for 40 years. One year for each of the 40 days you spent exploring the land. You will know what it means to have me against you. It's American Bible Society, 1992. 
when you've finished that, turn over on your right side and suffer for the guilt of Judah for 40 days, one day for each year of their punishment, again, from the Good News Bible. So here we have two passages from Scripture, one found in Numbers 14, 34, and the other in Ezekiel 4, 6, that clearly spell out that God is accustomed to using this kind of symbolism in his prophecies. Um, so on what basis do we use the year-day principle in interpreting these long time periods of prophecies? Well, let's look at some of them. Look at Daniel 7.25. He will speak against the supreme God and oppress God's people. He will try to change their religious laws, festivals, and God's people will be under his power for three and a half years. Okay, now if you're reading that just simply, you would say three and a half years. Okay, that's three calendar years, half a calendar year. But what do you do when you come to 8.14, Daniel 8.14? I heard the other angel answer, it will continue for 2,300 evenings and mornings. How long is that? During which sacrifices? days. Yeah. Which, during which sacrifices will not be offered, then the temple will be restored. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. And Revelation 11, 12, and 13, and I'm not going to read all those passages, where three equivalent time periods are mentioned. Three and a half years, and if you realize that each month in those ancient times was exactly 30 days, then that equals to 42 months. Three times 12 is 36, and half a year would be six more, would be 42. And 1260 days, so they're all exactly the same time periods. So here are two prophets working over a period of 600 years apart from each other, and they're giving these prophecies revealed by God, and they're mentioned the same time period. Hmm, hmm. that's significant. We need to recognize that the ancient Mesopotamians, the people who lived in that valley, where it's rock, Iraq now, had a 360-day calendar, and each month was 30 days in length. So we can see a clear equivalence between three and a half years, 42 months, and 1260 days. In these prophecies, Charles? Three other elements support the year-day principle in these prophecies of Daniel, Daniel and Revelation, the use of symbols, long time periods, and peculiar expressions. First, the symbolic nature of the beasts and horns representing kingdoms suggests that the time expressions also should be understood as symbolic. The beasts and the horns are not to be taken literally. They are symbols of something else. Hence, because the rest of the prophecy is symbolic, not literal, why should we take the time prophecies along as literal? The answer, of course, is that we shouldn't. Second, many of the events of the kingdoms depicted in the prophecies cover a time span of many centuries, which would be impossible if the time prophecies depicted them were taken literally. Once the year-day principle is applied, the time fits the events in a remarkably accurate way, something that would be impossible if the time prophecies were taken literally. Finally, the peculiar expressions used to designate these time periods suggest a symbolic interpretation. In other words, the ways in which time is expressed in these prophecies for example, the 2300 evening and mornings of Daniel 8.24 NIV, 8.14 NIV are not the normal ways to express time, showing us that the time period depicted are, the, are to be taken symbolically, not literally. Adult Adventist uh, Sabbath Bible Study Guide for Monday, June 8. So, what are we talking about here? Well, here are these time periods. Now, if you type, if you, and, and it's talking about three of these kingdoms are literally mentioned by name in, in Daniel's day. He talks about Babylon. He talks about Medo-Persia. He talks about Greece. There they are. So you can't crush their, or squeeze their, their, their histories into a period of three and a half literal years. This is not possible. So you need to figure out some way to spread it out. And what's amazing is that if you spread it out, following the exact stuff that we're going to, we're going into more details here, if you spread it out, 
bingo, everything fits exactly. It's just amazing the, the timing of all this. God is working perfect time, clockwork. And the, some of the reformers did look at it this way as well. Mm -hmm. But there's perhaps another most more compelling reason why we need to use the year-day principle. Daniel 9.25 tells us that the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince would be 69 weeks. If this is literal time, it would be one year, four months, and one week. Completely impossible. Obviously, that is completely impossible. But if we use the year-day principle, we calculate the 490 years later and discover that the prophecy was incredibly accurate, historically dating down to the exact time of Christ's baptism in A.D. 27. Mm. Wow. The seventh, and, and if, you, if you go and you, you compare that with the history of the Christian church, you find out that it fits with Paul's experiences, the, everything. It's just amazing. Uh, one thing maybe for everyone watching, uh, the when we go from BC to AD, mm -hmm. there has to be that one year. Yeah. Okay. So why is there? No, why was there no zero year named zero? <laughs> there is no zero in that Roman is, numerals. Right. They were using the Roman numeral system. They ha there was no zero in Roman numerals. So you come down to one BC, and the next year has to be one AD. We're using our Arabic numbers that we use, and with the zero, it means that the they, it would try it would go down to 1843. It, would, it wouldn't go to 1844. But if you realize that there's no zero, then it goes right to 1844. Um, the Seventh Day Adventist interpretation of prophecies fits so perfectly with historical events that it is amazing that not everyone who's a Bible student sees it. Of course, if you see it clearly then you must understand the significance of 1844, and you'll probably need to become a Seventh-day Adventist. Oh, dear. <laughs> well, Daniel 7, 1 to 25, I'm not going to read the whole passage, but I'm going to read a few verses, dropping down to starting with verse 7. As I was watching, a fourth beast appeared. It was powerful, horrible, terrifying, with its huge iron teeth, it would crush its victims, and when it trampled, trampled on them, unlike the other beasts, that had ten horns. While I was staring at the horns, I saw a little horn coming up among the others. It tore out three of the horns that were already there. This horn had human eyes and a mouth that was boasting proudly. While I was looking, thrones were put in place. One had been living forever, who had been living forever, sat down on one of the thrones. Okay? Hmm. Who, who is it that has been living forever? It has to be God. His clothes were white as snow, and his hair was like pure wool. His throne, mounted on fiery wheels, was blazing with fire, and a stream of fire was pouring out from it. From it, there were many thousands of people there to serve him, and millions of people stood before him. The court began its session, and the books were opened. And so, this is a a, a court scene taking place here somewhere at a critical point. And then, if we had time, we would read Daniel eight. In Daniel 2, Daniel clearly identifies the head of gold as Babylon and specifically the first king, Nebuchadnezzar. That fits with the lion, which was a very good representation of Babylon in Daniel 7. We talked about that in a previous lesson. In Daniel 8, we find the second and third animals or kingdoms identified as Medo-Persia and Greece. So now we have Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece. Unless one absolutely refuses to accept the idea that God can predict the future, the next obvious kingdom would have to be Rome. Rome. Who conquered the Greeks? It was Rome. There was no break in history between Greece and Rome. So, the next major interpretive challenge regards the little horns in Daniel 7 and 8. Are these two separate entities, or might they be describing the same entity? Well, let's just look at some key points. There are seven common characteristics between the little horns of Daniel 7 and Daniel 8. One, both are described as a horn. Two, both are persecuting powers, Daniel 7, 21 and 25, and Daniel 8, 10 and 24. Both are self-exalting and blasphemous against God, 
Daniel 7, 8, 20, and 25, and Daniel 8, 10, 11, and 25. Both target God's people, Daniel 7, 25, and Daniel 8, 24. Both have aspects of their activity delineated by prophetic time, Daniel 7, 25, and Daniel 8, 13, and 14. Are you, see some, are you seeing some parallels here? Both extend until the end of time. Let me read these particular verses. Look at Daniel 7, 25 and 26. He will speak against the supreme God and oppress God's people. He will try to change their religious laws and festivals. And God's people will be under his power for three and a half years. Then the heavenly court will sit in judgment, take away his power and destroy him completely. When does that happen? At the very end, right? Very end, right. Okay. Look at Daniel 8, 17 and 19. Um, Gabriel came and stood beside me, and I was so terrified that I fell to the ground. He said to me, mortal man, understand the meaning. The vision has to do with the end of the world. And he talks about some things else, but dropping down to 19 and said, I am showing you that what the result of God's anger will be. The vision refers to the time of the end. So if these are too parallel, then we have we can nail down who this this individual is or this group is or whatever it's referring to. Both are to be supernaturally destroyed. Daniel 7, 11, and 26, and Daniel 8. Look, look at Daniel 8, 25. Because he is cunning, he will succeed in his deceitful ways. He will be proud of himself and destroy many people without warning. He will even defy the greatest king of all, but he will be destroyed without the use of any human power. Who's going to conquer the great enemy? Jesus. Not us. It will be God, right? It is interesting to note that the head of gold ends and the chest and arms begin. The same is true of the belly and thighs of brass and then the legs of iron. But when we get down to the feet, the iron never ends. It continues, although mixed with clay right into the toes. Then comes the kingdom of God. There is no other power that could possibly fit this description except this description of iron except Rome. Rome. Which one of these powers, even though it changes in its character in some respects, com continues to dominate, continues to be a major power? So out of Rome comes that little horn, which tears out three other horns known uh, uh, from that terrifying beast. And who could the little horn represent? The Pope. Up until the times of the Protestant Reformation, even up until the 1800s, all serious biblical scholars interpreted that little horn as representing the papacy. Look at the following chart adapted from the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Wednesday, June 10. So here we have Daniel 7. And what do we see in Daniel 7? Babylon is represented as a lion. Medo-Persia is represented as <laughs> a bear. Yeah. And if we had time, we would show you that uh, each one of these animals is given some uh, descriptions. What, what do they do? Da-da-da-da. So forth. Where do they go? Etc. And it fits exactly the kingdom that is prophesied about it. In Greece, is represented by a leopard. Pagan Rome is represent, represented by the fourth beast and papal Rome by the little horn. And if we go to Daniel 8, by the time he writes Daniel 8, he's already, the Babylonian kingdom is gone. He's already into Medo-Persia, so Babylon is left out. But Medo-Persia is named as the ram. Greece is named as the he-goat. And pagan Rome and papal Rome are there in the sequence. Do you often remember about what years that Papal Rome came into power. Yeah, seven or eight hundreds or so. Or? Well, the papal no the the papal power, of course, gradually ascended right. to strength. Right. It wasn't like bang on yeah, one day it suddenly was right. powerful. That's why I asked but you. The, the, when is yeah, the, the the what really happened was Constantine in three in the three thirties, three forties, something like that, decided that. I mean, in those days, the Roman power was all the way stretched from from Rome and Spain all the way up to England in, in the north, all the way over to Arabia, no. Arabia and so forth. Yeah. Well, it turns out that, that Constantine was much more at home in the eastern part of that kingdom. Surely. 
So he decided to move the headquarters of the Roman Empire to, to what, we, what came to be called Constantinople, named after him. Right. It's now called Istanbul. And so he was the military and power, political power over there. But Rome was still regarded itself as a major, major power over here. Well, who's in charge in Rome? Nobody. The religious leader. He didn't move. So the bishop of Rome gradually ascends more and more power. Well, then in uh, a couple hundred years later, 530, 538, along about that time, uh, nations, came, people from the north came down, one, some of these ten tribes that we, mm -hmm. we read about, and they tried to conquer Rome. And sometimes some of them sacked Rome and so forth and caused problems. But finally, the Pope said, that's enough. They had the, the walls built around Rome, and uh, some events happened that I, we don't have time to spell out, but the, pap the, the Pope went out as the leader of a military group and conquered one of these nations, wiped them out, the military, wiped out their army. And he came back and said, hmm, I can be not only a priest, I can a religious leader, I can be a civil leader, I can be a military leader. And that combination is deadly. So that was about the 538 BC. Right. 538. Yeah, 538 is an important Yeah, that's the beginning, that's the beginning of the right, beginning right. of the 1260 days. 1260 days. Yeah. Right. Hmm. So what happens after the feet of iron and clay? The kingdom. The, the, the rock. The rock. Carved yeah. without hands right. from the mountain, completely destroys all the kingdoms, leaving them nothing but powder, <clears throat> blown away by the evening breeze. That rock expands until it encompasses the entire world. It clearly represents what? The kingdom of God. The, the kingdom of God. But before we come to that final stage, we notice in Daniel 7, 9 to 14, that there's a judgment scene. I already read about that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Millions of beings surround the throne of God where the Father is administering judgment while Satan accuses God's people and Christ defends them. And where do we read about that? Daniel 7. Zechariah 3, right? Yeah. <clears throat> but when we line up Daniel 7 and Daniel 8, it seems clear that the pre-advent judgment predicted in Daniel 7 the judgment scene described there in Daniel 7 <clears throat> lines up with the cleansing of the sanctuary in Daniel 9, Daniel 8, verse 14. So we saw those boom, boom, boom when they lined up together. Now we have the judgment scene lined up parallel to the what? The cleansing of the sanctuary. What does the judgment scene have to do with the cleansing of the sanctuary? Well, what happened in the cleansing of the sanctuary back in biblical times? That's the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement. And what happens in the Day of Atonement? You can read all about it in Leviticus 16. We won't at, at one minute. At one minute. So that was the end of the religious year. Right. And the beginning of the new religious year. And everybody was expected to... to clean out their houses, to get rid of any traces of sin, to uh, cleanse every, you know, wash everything, clean it up, throw out all your yeast, etc., etc., and start over. This is a, the beginning, the end of the old and the beginning of the new. So how do we determine the starting point for these two long-time prophecies? Well, Daniel 9.24, what does it say? Seven times 70 years is the length of time God has set for freeing your people and your holy city from sin and evil. Seven times 70, how long is that? 490. Sin will be forgiven and eternal justice established so that the vision and the prophecy will come true and the holy temple will be rededicated. Hmm. Tells us that the prophecy of 70 weeks or 490 years regarding the Jewish nation is cut off from the vision of 2300 days of Daniel 8.14. Now, we know in, in Adventist history how we got this all figured out. Who was it that figured it out? William Miller. William Miller, exactly. 
What did William, William Miller do? He started through the Bible and he said, okay, I'm going to read one verse and I'm going to study it until I think I understand it fully and then I'm going to go to the next verse. Boom, 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 boom. And when he got over to Daniel, he struggled with some of the prophecies in Daniel. And he said, this period of 490 years is cut off? What could it be cut off from? Well, you can't cut off something out of the middle of something. You have to cut it off if either the beginning or the end. He said, oh, back there in Daniel 8, 14, it talks about 2,300 years. So we could cut 490 off of that 2,300, couldn't we? And that's what he went back and looked at. Yeah, historically, you can figure it out. And we read uh, Ezra 7, verse 7 says, <clears throat> Ezra was a scholar with a thorough knowledge of the law, which the Lord, the God of Israel, had given to Moses. Because Ezra had the blessing of the Lord his God, the emperor gave him everything he asked for. In the seventh year of the reign of Artaxerxes, Ezra set out from Babylonia for Jerusalem with a group of Israelites, which included priests, Levites, temple musicians, temple guards, and workmen. So, and if you read, if we had time to read down the document, what did he, what was Ezra told? What, what, what did the emperor tell him in this letter? To rebuild Jerusalem. You could go home, go back to Jerusalem. You can use the money to re make sure the temple is completely finished and offer some sacrifices for myself and my son. And then, if there's money left over, you can use it for whatever you think is needed for the benefit of the city. How could this heathen man who worships the moon god say go and follow your well see they believed in multiple gods so he said okay there's another god over there i need the blessing of that god too yeah. <laughs> that's that's basically what happened okay and he gives ton of money mm -hmm. tons of money gave a lot of money yes so all we have to do now is figure out when was the seventh year of artaxerxes can we do that but what's amazing is that about that time, two different years this happened, plus I mean, around about that time, someone in ancient times sat down and said, on such and such a day, on such and such a month, there was a solar eclipse. On such and such a day, there was a lunar eclipse. And then this other day, there's, there's a lunar eclipse here, there's a lunar eclipse here. And the astronomers can back up the, the records and tell you, oh, Based on these records from the ancient times, we know exactly what year that was. Hmm. And we can nail it down uh, exactly to the, I mean, we're, we're plus or minus a few days, we can know exactly when this happened. And so we come up with the year of 457 BC. Counting forward 2,300 years, we come to 1844, since there was no year zero. We mentioned that the Roman numeral system didn't have any zeros in it. Interestingly enough, that came shortly after the apparent demise of the Roman Catholic Church. And when did that happen? It wasn't the real demise, but it was. 1798. 1798. And that was, why is that, that date important? Well, um, that's also 2300. And no, this no, is the, the end of the 1260 date. Right, 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 sorry. Right, right. That 538 we talked about earlier, right. 1260 comes to 1798. Mm -hmm. The Pope was taken captive by General Berthier, Berthier. who was, worked for, for Napoleon, put into prison, and a short time later he died. Well, we need to notice several other things about biblical prophecy. Apocalyptic prophecies, such as those we are studying in Daniel and Revelation, have one single fulfillment, okay? We should not expect to find a type and antitype in these prophecies. Furthermore, Daniel clearly named three of those major kingdoms in his prophecies. So it's getting harder and harder to, to misinterpret this if you take all the evidence and you line it up. The only safe way to determine that a prophecy has a type and an antitype is to see it spelled out by a New Testament writer himself. Can you give an example of that? Well, look at the first four verses of, of uh, 1 Corinthians 10. I want you to remember, my brothers and sisters, what happened to our ancestors who followed Moses. 
They were all the, under the protection of the cloud and all passed safely through the Red Sea in the cloud and in the sea that were all, they were all baptized as followers of Moses. All ate the same spiritual bread and drank the same spiritual drink. They drank from the spiritual rock that went with them and that rock was? Jesus Christ. Christ himself. Yeah, exactly. So, and then you compare these prophecies uh, and we can see the types and antitypes are quite obvious to anyone familiar with the Bible. Many Christians today think that the Old Testament has a little, if any, of value to say to us. But in the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, we find that it is very much based on the Old Testament sanctuary system and especially the high priestly ministry of Jesus Christ. Some interpreters have gone all out in interpreting every little detail of that system. The sanctuary system does have, have an important relationship to the plan of salvation, but we need to remember Hebrews 10, 1 to 4. The Jewish law is not a full and faithful model of the real things. It is only a faint outline of the good things to come. The same sacrifices are offered forever, year after year. How can the law then, by means of these sacrifices, make perfect the people who, came, who come to God? If the people worshiping God had really been purified from their sins, they would not feel guilty of sin anymore, and all the sacrifices would stop. As it is, however, the sacrifices serve year after year to remind people of their sins, for the blood of bulls and goats can never save no, excuse me, never take away sin. So, I mean, think about the old system. We, we read about it all through the Old Testament. Every year you were supposed to bring your sacrifice, at, at least once a year, to sacrifice, to confess your sins over that lamb and so forth. So if the doing that one time had managed to completely stop you from sinning, you would never need to bring another sacrifice, Right. So the fact that you needed to repeatedly come and bring more sacrifices is proof that it wasn't a perfect system. It was a faint shadow. Given what we know about the cleansing of the sanctuary, which will take place on the antitypical Day of Atonement, is it clear how that relates to the judgment scene portrayed in Daniel 7, 9 to 14? So we said that the typical Day of Atonement, what happened? The camp was purified. All the sins were taken out. And on that particular day, of course, there were those special services offered and the sins were, were taken from, uh, the, the, the one, one ram was sacrificed and the, the high priest went into the most holy place. He carried in, in symbol those sins out of the tabernacle and placed it on the heads of that other scapegoat. And the scapegoat is led by somebody off far away into the desert and left out there probably to be consumed, almost certainly to be consumed by some wild animal. So, but in symbolism, what did that mean to the children of Israel? The coming Messiah. Yeah, but think about it. What, the, what they were saying is, the, ch the child was looking at that and says, there go my sins. Hmm. They're gone. Don't you think that's what it meant to them? I'm sure that's what it meant to them. The, the scapegoat. Yeah, when the scapegoat is, mm -hmm. here's the man leading the scapegoat off and into the off into the wilderness. My sins are gone. I'm I have a fresh start. I can, and so what's what's happening in the antitypical day of atonement? Judgment takes place, right? And who's saved? Those people who choose to follow God's directions for their lives. Those who choose to listen. And those who choose to listen. And so they're separated from the, 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 the righteous are separated from the wicked. So what's happened? Sins are eliminated. Same story. Considering how well all these historical events match the prophecies, why do you think so many Christians today reject the historicist interpretation? Anybody want to venture that one? Well, is your trust in the historicist method of interpretation established more firmly by, by what we have seen in this lesson? I hope so. Yeah. Remember, we. I have a little yeah. side question. Have some seekers, believers, 
made the mistake of looking at the scapegoat as sin bearer, therefore representing Christ. Mm -hmm. There, there are people who have accused Adventists of making of, of having Satan as their savior, because they, he bears our sins, because of this idea. Right. right. Yeah. That's, that's, but yeah. the the scapegoat wasn't sacrificed. Right. The one who was sacrificed is the other it ram. It. Right. Right. The other goat. So no, it doesn't fit. But there are people who have tried to say that. How well do you understand the details of the prophecies of seventy weeks and twenty two hundred years days? The precision of the dates and how they fit together exactly with New Testament history, which can be confirmed from extra biblical sources, is truly amazing. Another very important thing to remember, which is an encouragement to true believers, and the prophecies in Daniel is found in Daniel 7, 18, 21, 22, and so forth. Carrie? Yeah. And the people of the supreme God will receive royal power and keep it forever and ever. While I was looking, that horn made war on God's people and conquered them. Then the one who had been living forever came and pronounced judgment in favor of the people of the supreme God. The time had arrived for God's people to receive royal power. He, the little horn power, will speak against the supreme God and oppress God's people. He will try to change their religious laws and festivals, and God's people will be under his power for three and a half years. The power and greatness of all the kingdoms on earth will be given to the people of the supreme God. Their royal power will never end, and all rulers on earth will serve and obey them. Wow, what a change. Bible. Yes, mm, yeah. that's coming in heavy there. Whoa. <laughs> so the Protestant Reformation saw a revival of Bible study under the impetus of sola scriptura. It was easy for the scholars of the Bible in Reformation times, such as Wycliffe, Luther, Zwingli, Knox, others, to see the historicist accuracy of Daniel 7 and 8. And they clearly believed that the little horn power represented the Roman Catholic Church, the papal power. This, of course, made them a direct target of the Roman Catholic hierarchy's wrath. And during those years, thousands, even millions of people were killed for their Protestant beliefs. What percentage of Protestants believe this? What percentage of Protestants? Yeah, to, today, that these, oh, these reformers who believe believed that? in that. Oh, yeah. Right, right. So sad. So sad. It is yeah. really, truly so sad. And they're the ones who paid by their blood. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The number of people who lost their lives, the Huguenots mostly, mostly yeah. in France, lost their lives at this time was just... Astronomical. Astronomical. But once again, all this was predicted in Revelation 12, 13 to 17. Let me just look at that. When the dragon realized that he had been thrown down to the earth, he began to pursue the woman who had given birth to the boy. She was given the two wings of a large eagle in order to fly to her place in the desert, where she would be taken care of for three and a half years. There's the, prof there's the three and a half years again. Safe from the dragon's attack. And then from his mouth the dragon poured out a flood of water after the woman, so that it would carry her away. But the earth helped the woman. It opened its mouth and swallowed the water that had come from the dragon's mouth. How do we understand that the earth helped the woman? There are two huge things that happened uh, that, that represent the saving of, of people. One is, just about that time, people were first moving to the United States, to America. Yeah. And so many of these people fleeing from the wrath of the Catholic Church fled to America. That was one. The other thing was the Walden Seas who had been trying to preach the Protestant thing right through all these years, the stories, if you read the stories about how God protected them, it's amazing, just amazing. One time, a whole bunch of them were, were trapped at the top of a mountain, and the Roman army was down at the bottom, and they said, okay, tomorrow I'll, we'll, we'll just march up there and we'll wipe all these people out. And in the middle of the night, that whole group, including small children, marched down that mountain in single file, walked right through the Roman camp and out the other side. And when the Romans woke up the next morning, 
they were disappearing over the hill in the other direction. That's just one example of the ways in which uh, they were protected by the mountains, literally by the earth in this case. Uh, the dragon was furious with the woman and went off to fight against the rest of her descendants, all those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to the truth revealed by Jesus. So do you think the time is going to come when the dragon, the dragon won't be furious against us anymore? <laughs> no. We, he knows that if, if, if we get together and we speak the truth and we represent God correctly, what happens? His time's up. Right. right. Fortunately for Protestants, about that same time as the persecution, the new nation known as the United States was arising across the ocean, somewhat removed from the influence of the Roman Catholic Church. Professors from Harvard, Yale, and Princeton, Princeton trained ministers in the true understanding of biblical prophecy. It's hard to imagine that happening <laughs> no. in those places today. But you can be sure that Rome was not what? Asleep. Asleep. Preterism. We've talked about that already. So now, what is preterism? Did we, have we understood it? Preterism is the idea that the prophecies of the Bible, all the prophecy events of the Bible, especially the ones from the book of Revelation, happened back in the time of John. There's nothing... Everything happened back there. So they want to apply all these prophecies in Revelation. Well, those are things that happened in the days of John. Yeah, because the prophecies talk about them. Yes. So they want to push it away somewhere exactly. else. Exactly. Well, this idea about preterism was developed by the Spanish Jesuit Luis de Alcazar, 1554 to 1613. And when did the Protestant Reformation get started? The 1540s? 1525, actually, 25. the very beginning. Yeah. 1540. So you see, here he is, right in the middle of that. Who interpreted the prophecies in the Bible as simple communicating, simply communicating events that happened in the past. Preterists largely denied the possibility of predictive prophecy. They believed that not even God himself can predict the future. The Alcazar projected the Antichrist power into the past, identifying it with the Roman Emperor Nero. Hmm. Another, any questions about that? It's, they, they, have, oh, they, they have all kinds of funny things going on, but anyway, I won't, we'll, we'll keep moving on. Another Spanish Jesuit, Francisco Rivera. No, he left, Francisco Rivera left the... You're thinking of uh, another Rivera. Roberto. Yeah, yeah, this, 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 is, this, is, this is 1591. Yeah. No, Roberto, that's his name, I think. Alberto. Alberto, right, yeah, right. Yeah, the, Alberto, he, he was in the 70s. Right, he was in he the was 70s. He was a former. You have heard that name? Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm going to No, but this man published a 500-page commentary on the book of Revelation, teaching that the majority of prophecy was to be filled at the very end of time in a brief three-and-a-half-year, literal brief, Three and a half year period. And many Protestants are gulping this stuff now. Yes. Yeah. There's, there's two main uh, modern interpretations of the, many people are going. Many of biblical scholars are going with the preterist idea right. that all happened back in John's day, and then the groups primarily these would be um, Pentecostal groups. Uh, you might have heard of a series of books called The Left Behind yeah, Books. Yeah, yeah. Those yeah, books are promoting, promoting the futurist idea that, okay, some people are going to be raptured and terrible things are going to happen and all these things are going to happen where? At the very end of this earth's history. Both of, those view, both of those views came from who? Just about the same time from Catholic priests. 500-page commentary. Imagine that teaching that the majority of prophecy was to be filled at the very end of time in a brief three-and-a-half-year period. Futurism went the opposite direction from that of the Alcazar, placing the emphasis of prophecy far into the future and leaving the papal church of the Middle Ages outside of the prophetic time frame altogether. <laughs> so what are they saying? Don't look at us. We didn't do it. Really, that's right, that's right. These two views, known, known as preterism, back, 
that it was done back in the days of John and Futurism at first received little attention. But in the 19th century, with the rise of the historical critical approach to Scripture and later the heavy influence of the Schofield Reference Bible, Jim, you have one of those, I'm sure? Yeah. <laughs> People were led to adopt these other forms of interpretation. Now we see that Seventh-day Adventists alone are maintaining their historicist understanding of Scripture. <clears throat> and, of course, we want to not just to have a historicist view, we want to have a great controversy view, a, a, a conflict, a, a you know, con thing that involves the entire universe in understanding all these things. Okay, preterism redates the prophecy of Daniel, the prophet Daniel, to the second century after Babylon, Medo Persia, and Greece come up, come on the scene. Further, preterism reinterprets the little horn power as a Seleucid king, Antiochus IV Epiphanes. Futurism also tends to interpret the little horn as Antiochus IV, but then suggests a future Antichrist to appear at the end of time. But this identification does not fit for several reasons. One, the origin of the little horn. The little horn came out of one of them, Daniel 8 9. Preterists argue that the little horn came out of one of the four horns, the generals Lysimachus, Cassander, Ptolemy, and Seleucus, and their successors as heads of the four Macedonian kingdoms, into which Alexander's empire was divided. But the grammatical, contextual, and syntactical evidence points to the conclusion that the little horn came out of one of the four winds, if you, look at, if you understand the, the Hebrew grammar, or compass points, an expression that immediately precedes the phrase. The so in other words, it's saying, this is not Antiochus Epiphany, it's not the fourth something, it's one of the four directions of the wind, and of course the, the direction was west, out where the Romans came from. Two, the progression of power and kings. The Medo-Persian ram magnified himself, the Greek he got magnified himself exceedingly, the little horn magnified itself even up to the prince of the host, Daniel 8.10. But this magnification of power cannot be attributed to a single weak ruler such as Antiochus IV. Fourth, he, was a, he was a nobody almost. The placement of order, Antiochus IV referred, this is the third point. Antiochus IV ruled in the middle of the Seleucid dynasty, the seventh in a series of 27 kings. He was actually toward the beginning. The little horn power appears at the latter end of their rule. Rome appears at the latter part of the Greek Empire, but Antiochus IV does not. Number four, the direction of conquest. The little horn power was to conquer toward the east, the south, and toward the beautiful land. Daniel 8, 9. That is, from the direction of the west. And they did. But Antiochus IV was responsible for, for losing Judea, the beautiful land, not conquering it, and he had only limited, acts, limited success in the south, in Egypt. Five, the abomination of desolation. Scholars believe that Antiochus IV caused the desolation of the sanctuary, but Jesus, quoting from Daniel, refers to this desolation as still in the future in his day, Matthew 25, 24, 15. And Antiochus IV already had been dead for two centuries. Mm -hmm. Jesus kept be talking about a future event about someone who was dead 200 years before. The evening and morning days, the 2200 evenings and mornings are interpreted as the sacri sacrifices that ceased during Antiochus IV's desecration of the temple. Thus, to accommodate the Antiochus interpretation, the number is reduced from 2300. They say, well, there's, 23, there's 1150 mornings and 1150 evenings. So they cut the time period down into half. But the phrase Arab Bukhar is very similar to the designation used in Genesis 1 to refer to the 24-hour day. The morning and evening sacrifices associated with the earthly sanctuary are referred to in a different order. However, thus the desolation mentioned in Daniel 8.13 does not refer to the stopping of the earthly sanctuary services during the time of Antiochus. 7. I mean, look, we've just got things bing, 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 bing down here. The prophetic close of the prophecy. The close relation between Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 indicates that there is a glorious conclusion. But if Judas Maccabeus, the Jew, defeated Antiochus IV, how does Judas come in the clouds of heaven like the Son of Man? Daniel 7, 13. And how is his kingdom eternal? 
Daniel 7, 14. It just can't be. So that's just a conclusion from Norman Gully's book, Systematic Theology of the Church in the Last Days, things. Neither the preterist nor the futurist interpretation matches the criteria in the text or, or the testimony of Jesus. So are we going to accept the testimony of Jesus? Are we going to line all these things up and find out how closely they match and come to the right conclusion? Are we going to say no, because of preconceived ideas, we're throwing out these ideas, we're not going to go there. Well, for these reasons and others, Antiochus' interpretation of Daniel 8 is untenable. It is only the historicist interpretation of prophecy that identifies accurately the last 2,600 years, starting from 605 B.C. to the present time of history and prophetic sequential perspective. So what happened in 605 B.C.? That's when Babylon came into power. That's when Babylon came to power and conquered Jerusalem. Yes. So that's when the, the gold started, the gold head started. So that's the beginning and 2,600 years almost down to whenever the second coming happens. It is important for us to recognize that both preterism and futurism were developed by Roman Catholic scholars as a direct counter to the sola scriptura interpretation of the Reformation Protestants. So these, in, these, these ideas were directly intended to, to shut down Protestantism. Why then should modern Protestant churches have adopted these ideas? Hmm. Well, at least one thing should be understood clearly. There is a desperate need for the three angels' messages calling for us to announce the day of God's judgment and to come out of Babylon. Are we doing that? And who has been given the three angels' message and who is supposed to be carrying these three angels' messages to the world? Us. Not us, right? <laughs> <laughs> Every one of us has been given a job. The only purpose in Scripture for having a church is to form a basis for teaching people how to go out and spread the news, the good news to other people. We have, a, we have a job to do, my friends. Not the pastor, all of us, every single one of us is to be representing God's story, the, his story, to the world in the, re, in the best possible terms. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, what a privilege it is to worship you. What a privilege it is to realize that our best friend is the king of the universe. And he knows the future, he knows the past, there's nothing outside of his control. And so, although we know a terrible time is coming, difficult experiences are, are, are going to happen, yet we know that if we put our trust in you, we can count on you to take us safely through these final events of this earth's history as prophesied here in the book of Daniel. We thank you for all of this. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.